ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, welcome back to the channel with some more news about radio-controlled model aircraft and drones and stuff that we fly and related topics, because sometimes stuff's related, but it's not all about drones. Anyway, let's see what i got today. Well, first of all, I've said on many occasions that you're at more risk of being injured by falling space junk, space rock, you know, than by drones or radio-controlled model aircraft. And the proof was again there to be seen this week when Mr. Alejandro Atero arrived home to his house in Naples, Florida, to find a hole in the roof and <laughs> quite a bit of damage inside. It wasn't a drone. No, he hadn't. His house hadn't been hit by a drone. It was falling space junk. In this case, it was what was left, apparently, of 2.6 tons of batteries that they'd hurled out the side of the International Space Station after they had served their useful purpose. Now, uh, what happens in the world of space stuff is that when your batteries are worn out, you toss them out the window from hundreds of miles above the Earth. The theory being that the re-entry process, they'll burn up and you will get a little bit of ash. You know, nothing, no one's going to get hurt by a little bit of ash. The reality is that sometimes they don't all burn up. And in this case, it's believed that uh, a fairly sizable chunk of that ISS battery, pallet of ISS batteries, made it to Earth and landed in Mr. Otero's house. Um, much to his cost. So, yeah. Um, and when you look at the other incidents of falling space stuff, injuring people and damaging property, they're quite remarkable. In the early 1900s, a large piece of space rock exploded over Russia and flattened a huge area of forest in the area of Tunguska. Uh, it's not sure how many people were killed, if any, because there were no records and it's a fairly sparsely populated area, but it certainly devastated a lot of forest. Then, almost a hundred years to the day later, well, hundred and a few years, I think, something almost identical happened over the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia. A large piece of space rock exploded in the sky and the resulting shockwave smashed windows across the entire city. Those broken windows flying through the air resulted in over 1,100 people being hospitalised with injuries and a lot of property damage. So when people say to you, these drones are dangerous, these recreational drones say, no, 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 no. You're far more likely to be injured and have your property damaged as a result of a piece of falling space junk. So what are the odds? Do you go outside and worry all the time that you're going to get hit on the head by a, a falling battery from the space station? No, you don't. So why would you worry about drones? Um, it's that media perception, isn't it? It's that, 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 that vilification process. But the reality, the facts, the evidence, it flies in the face of all these claims made by regulators and the media. We need to remind people of this constantly, especially the media. Now, while we're on the subject of the vilification of drones, one of the things I get thrown at me a lot is, these drones are dangerous, look what they're doing in Ukraine. You know, they've got these drones that put bombs on them and they're killing people. And, and my normal response is, yeah, it's not the drones that are causing the problem, it is the stuff that goes bang that they tie to it. And if you can get stuff that goes bang, you'll find any, any way you like to deliver that. Drones are not the problem. But it's turned out, well, look at this, here's a drone. Look at this, that drone there. Yeah, it's a drone. Look, blows up that factory. What's going on? Well, that is the latest Ukrainian drone weapon against Russia. This drone travelled hundreds of miles carrying a heavy payload of hundreds of pounds of stuff that goes bang and delivered it to a Russian factory that was making stuff that the Ukrainians didn't want made. And it was quite successful by the look of it. But it wasn't a quadcopter. It wasn't a recreational multi-rotor drone. It was a light aircraft. In fact, it was an Aeropract Foxbat A-22 by all reports. Now, this is a very common micro-light aircraft. There's quite a few of them in New Zealand here. In fact, we had a yellow one drop into the airfield quite a few years ago, and I did a video about it. There's a video on my channel. I'll try and remember to link to it, but if, you, if I don't, you can go and look. And then there was a white one in the news here, in fact, in the world news, because a few years ago, the person flying it, who just happened to be a media person, claimed that it was hit by a drone, smashed the windscreen, and he crashed in a field as a result. It was, it was alleged to be the first proven example of when a drone has brought down a manned aircraft and why drones are so dangerous. Of course, that wasn't the facts at all. This was a media person that was flying it, so naturally, drones are to blame. Part of the narrative. Turns out, on, in, on, on investigation, that there was no sign of a drone. And in fact, what had happened was the windscreen, which is just a lightweight plastic on those things, the windscreen was overdue for replacement. And over time, with vibration and ultraviolet light, the windscreens develop small cracks. If they are not replaced regularly, they can just spontaneously fracture, fly into pieces with all the air pressure on them. It's exactly what happened in this case. So this Rob Vaughan guy got cuts on his face and he looked a real mess. Yeah, because the windscreen was old and it broke. But that made headlines around the world with the anti-drone narrative. 
And the interesting thing is that that very aircraft, that very aircraft, same registration, that, that one is now domiciled here at the Tokara Airfield used for flight training. So <laughs> it's a very small world. But before people start vilifying our hobby, saying people can put bombs on these drones, you need to point out to them that, yeah, you could, in theory, put a small amount of bang stuff on one of our recreational drones. But how much bang stuff could you put in one of these ultralight aircraft that can be built by anybody without training, without a license, without any kind of uh, registration, without, with no oversight whatsoever? I mean, these recreational drones that we fly, registered, we've got to set a trust test, you know, we've got to um, comply with all sorts of regulations. These ultralight aircraft, no regulation. So why are we not more worried about the thing that can carry more bang stuff than the little thing that can carry no bang, virtually no bang stuff? This, again, this narrative is really getting out of hand and we need to put some reality back into the situation. But as I've said so many times, politicians, they have no time for facts, evidence, reality, reason, logic. No, 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 no. It's all about delivering tube socks. Yes. Now, something a little more upbeat for a change, thankfully. You know that flying model aircraft or drones, or especially FPV, it's a really uplifting experience. It's great for your mental health. And anything that's good for your mental health is good for your physical health, because we know that stress and worry is a major factor in things like cancer and so forth. If you're under a lot of stress, you're more likely to suffer from other life-changing physical ailments. So if you can free your mind of all those worries and stresses, you can relax and unwind, you are going to be healthier overall. We know this. There are plenty of people in this hobby who have suffered quite significant mental health issues, discovered FPV, and it has changed their lives. Even people with substance addictions have found FPV. It has changed their lives for the better. So it's a fantastic thing. From a, from a wellness and a health perspective, FPV especially is brilliant. And, well, we knew it, but finally the the, the insurers, the people who provide health insurance and pay your medical bills, they've realised it too. And I saw a video from the AMA this week in which they say that the, the AMA dues, the subscription, annual subscription to be a member of the AMA, can now be claimed back from health insurers. It's refundable. Because the health insurers realise that the cost of a membership of a club where you go and enjoy yourself flying model aircraft and drones is, is, is worth uh, much less than the benefits that it produces. And insurers are canny businesses. They're very, very clever. When it comes down to risk, there is no better place to get your information than from an insurer. Because look at the way the business works. You, as an insurer, have to establish how risky something is. So you can set your premiums, your prices, uh, to the right level. For example, if you overestimate the risk, your prices will be too high. No one will buy your insurance. If you underestimate the risk, your prices will be low and everyone will buy, but you'll end up paying out more money than you collect. So you go out of business. So insurers spend huge amounts of effort to get their risk assessment just right. They know exactly what risks are. So if you look at it, they're saying that the benefits of flying this hobby greatly exceed the risks. And we know that. Regulators need to know that. Something we can use when we go into battle for our rights and our freedoms. And it's also something to consider when you look at regulation as a whole. Now, regulators have told us these drones are dangerous. The media has told us these drones are dangerous. Politicians tell us these drones are dangerous. Insurers are saying these drones are so damn safe that we'll give you millions of dollars in coverage for a few tens of dollars a year. Now, who are you going to believe? The people whose very existence is reliant on doing the very accurate risk assessment or politicians and regulators who pull stuff out of their backsides just to justify ridiculous levels of overregulation. I know who I trust. Now, if you fly a quad or a fixed wing using iNav, you will be pleased to know that there's a new version, iNav 1.7. And according to Pavel Spachowski, whose name I butcher every time I use it, it has an amazing new feature. It enables you to use GPS functionality without a compass magnetometer on a quadcopter. So if you, are, if you want to have a hover in position, it'll do that. If you want return to home, uh, it'll do that. Now, I know Betaflight claims a return Betaflight GPS rescue, but in my experience, it doesn't always work as well as is advertised. Maybe the new version's better, but iNav is offering these functions without having to have a compass, which is brilliant because compasses, well, they're a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, they're, they're affected by magnetic fields. They have to be calibrated sometimes. And on a small craft especially, you can't really use them effectively because you've got high current traveling and wiring very close to the magnetometer upsets readings. So this is a great breakthrough. If it's going to work as advertised, I think that's really good. And it's well worth looking at INAV as an option. I'm thinking of putting it on my 7-inch, I won't say long range, I'll say extended endurance quad, because I would like some of the features that INAV offers uh, that Betaflight doesn't. So 
hmm, I will keep you informed on how that goes. But go over to Pavel's channel and have a look at his latest video on iNav 7.1 if that's something you're interested in. Now DJI is the company some of us love to love, some of us love to hate. It's a very polarizing company. A lot of people wouldn't touch DJI with a barge pole because they don't like them. And the US government wants to kick them out. They want to ban all DJI gear that uses radio frequencies through by removing the FCC approval. If that's the case, then none of your drones will be legally able to be flown. And even things like the FPV system and this wireless microphone would be illegal to use. So I don't know what's going to happen there. Initially, nobody thought that this bill would have any traction, but it's actually getting a lot of support. So it's looking a bit worrisome for those who have DJI or heavily invested in DJI. That gear may soon become contraband and illegal to use. I hope not. I doubt it. But there's always the possibility. But in the meantime, DJI, the Avata too. Well, the leaks are everywhere. It's worse than a Titanic. So there are pictures all over the net. There's all sorts of specifications out there. And what do I think? Well, the original Avata was what the FPV drone should have been in the first place. A great introduction to FPV for people who are used to flying camera drones or have never flown FPV. A robust little craft, handled well enough, um, had lots of safety features, protected props, all that sort of stuff. Nice shrink wrapped. You didn't have to learn how to program anything. It was brilliant. Fantastic option. Um, I, as I say, I'm not a DJI fan, but I'm more than willing to acknowledge when they do something right. And they've done a really good job with the Avata. But now we have the Avata 2 are just around the corner. And what's it going to mean? Well, it's going to mean a lot of people will be selling their Avatars because they want the latest and the greatest. And unfortunately, if the rumours are to be believed, there isn't a lot of backwards compatibility there. You won't be able to use your Avata 2 or Avata 1 batteries in a new Avata 2. Buy new batteries. You won't be able to use your existing goggles too or your Integras. You have to buy new goggles. Uh, so it's going to be an expensive proposition for anyone that wants to go from the original Avata to the Avata 2. You have to weigh up whether you're going to get enough benefit from it. So what are the benefits of the new Avata 2? Well, Allegedly, the camera is better, the video link is better, and it's quieter. And I think quieter is going to be a big, it's going to be a major deal for some people because the biggest complaint most people had about, apart from the washout problem, which was resolved a bit, the biggest complaint most people had about the Avata was the noise. Any pusher cynic type quad is going to be noisy. If you've got props on the bottom, it will be noisy because the air flowing into those props has been turbulated by the arms. And just like a, a fire siren, um, that uses a deliberately turbulated air flowing into a rotating disc, when you have turbulent air going into a prop disc, it makes a racket. You notice pusher wings, fixed wings, the pusher ones, noisy as hell. Put a propeller on the front, super quiet. So that's just physics. You can't kind of change the laws of physics, a lot of So what they've done is they've done what they should have had in the first place. They've turned it around, put the motors on the bottom, the props on the top, so the props are sucking in nice smooth air so it'll be a lot quieter. I have a number of cine quads here and the ones that are props on top are always much quieter than the props on bottom ones. So, And the other benefit of having props on top is if you land on grass you can take off again. <laughs> props on bottom, if the grass is anything other than very short it'll fail the props you can't take off again. How? What? What's the point in that? So yeah they've done what they should have done right from the get-go. Other than that eh, there's, there's other changes but I, it's going to be a choice whether you upgrade. I, I'm not going to buy any DJI drones because it's not a political thing. It's just that I can't fly them around here. It's a no-fly zone. And I, when I buy a quad or anything, I want to buy it and own it. I don't want to be given it and be told you can use it only when we say you can use it. Only where we say you can use it. You haven't bought anything. You've just paid someone a whole lot of money and they've let you hold on to something temporarily. But ownership should be such that you, the, the original, the manufacturer has no further control over when and where that can be used. And that's not DJI. They have that full control. So in a way, I can see what the American politicians are on about. You've got a million drones in the USA, and at any time, the Chinese could say, eh, we'll turn those off, or we'll do this, we do that. They've still got control. I don't think that anyone's drones should have the control vested in a foreign power. <laughs> so, but that's just me. I could be wrong. You, you might go into the comments on my man parts. Tell me what you think about that. Um, what else have we got on my list of things to look at? Oh yes, airliners. Oh, I always like to cover a bit of airliner stuff because as I say, airliners and drones, you know, they're constant companions in the skies if we listen to the media. And uh, we've seen reports where, you know, pilots can spot a tiny drone from a mile away while they're traveling at, you know, 500 miles an hour through the stratosphere. Um, no problem, eagle eyes. Yet, yet, <laughs> this week alone, there have been two incidents that caught my eye. First of all, um, at, I think it was in, was it in uh, Heathrow, in Heathrow, had to make notes, I'm old, I forget. Heathrow, two airliners collided on the tarmac, cra wingtips crashed into each other, because you can see a drone at five miles, but you can't see an airliner 
right next to you, apparently. That have reversing, they should have reversing, you know, wing mirrors on the front of the things I can see behind, but no, apparently not. So there's a bit of damage went on there. That happened, there was one in Tokyo too, Tokyo Airport, just a few weeks ago. So this is increasingly common. Airliners are banging into each other on the taxiways. <laughs> What's going on? I don't know. Um, and then perhaps the best one of all is that at LaGuardia Airport, an airliner almost hit the control tower. Yep, that's right. Pilots can see drones at a mile away. They can't see a control tower at the same distance. I am a little worried, but to be, to be totally fair, the, the, the uh, conditions were marginal. Visibility was one mile, which is 5,000 feet, 5,280 feet actually. Um, so that was at the limits of visibility and apparently the airliner was off track and if it hadn't done a go round, it would have smacked into the tower. <laughs> so, Commercial aviation, as I said, it's in a very sad way at the moment. There's a lot of, and, and people have presented it to me. It's all about the, the policies, the hiring policies of the FAA is put, up, and the and the manufacturers has basically dispensed with hiring people on competency and qualification and focused on other aspects, personal aspects when it comes to hiring. There are quotas for certain things and that's causing safety issues. I don't know, I'm not involved, I can't comment, just telling you what other people have said because if I did comment YouTube would shut my channel down because that's what they do. <laughs> I've seen several instances this week of people getting their channels totally demonetized because they were not saying the right things. Nothing illegal, just not, they didn't tow the line one might say, oh I don't know. Anyway so that's about it I think for another, another week, yeah that's it. Yeah, that's all you get. Now, you might have wondered why have there not been a whole lot of videos recently. Well, it's my hands. It's not tremors. It's a thing called dystonia. And it is really annoying. I can cope with tremors. Dystonia. Oh, I mean, look it up on Google. You'll find out what it's all about. It's, it's, it's really bad. I think I found a way to manage it. I've dramatically reduced it through some changes I've made and basically timing. Uh, time when times of the day when I do stuff, so I am getting on top of that. But it has been a major hurdle. This Parkinson's a pain in the bloody backside, I tell you. But I think I'm on top of that, so I will keep you informed on that. But I do have some footage on the computer to be edited up, which I hope you will enjoy. And I've got some really interesting things coming up later this week, which also I'll get filmed and put up there. So yeah, things will be back to pretty much normal fairly soon, I hope. In the meantime, I thank those people who are helping me to continue doing what I'm doing as much as I can do. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Comments down to the commenty bit down there, and uh, I appreciate your support. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Oh, and if you've got any tips, any, show us your tips, send me an email or whatever if you've got news stories you think should be included. Bye for now. Oh, before I go, <laughs> yes, I did see the video with um, the Mythbusters flying the drone into the dummy. And if you didn't, I'll leave a link down there. Spotcha. Overregulation is like a tumor. It's killing a hobby. It must be terminated. Now!